Now, we are in the last days. There's just no doubt about it. Uh, if you wanted to do this, I, I, I'm not tempted, okay? I'm not even tempted. I would only want to do this just as an academic exercise just to prove my point. But if you wanted to start a heresy, this is the best time in history. <laughs> really, really. You know why? Because there is a spirit around the globe that, is, that, that, that it just permeates the air. Do you understand? Uh, I, I, might have, I might have related this to you. You know, I was in evangelism from 1973 to 78, first time. And if I asked 10 pastors, what, what's your problem? Tell me what the problems you have. I would get about, I'd get about eight different answers. Yeah, somebody, you know, there'd be a couple of men there that have the same thing. But I would get, uh, the last guy made a mess, I got to clean it up. Uh, the town doesn't like us here. Uh, our building was built on a bad foundation. We got to rebuild it. Uh, you know, I mean, there'd just be all kinds. Of, I'd get about eight different answers from 10 different guys. Uh, if I asked today, 10 pastors, what is your problem? I think eight of them would give me the same answer. And it's this, and it's twofold. I can get people saved, but I can't get them into church. And I can't get my people to do what they know they should. And, and I was looking at that, uh, you know, and, I, and I'm, I, I'm in my country and I'm in a different church every week. And, and I was in Australia and I was talking to an Australian pastor and I said, now, what, what are the problems you have? And he, he said, well, you know, he said, Australia is not the United States. I said, yeah. And he said, uh, you know, the Australian people are different. And I said, yeah. And he said, Australian culture is different. Yeah. And he said, so our problems would be different than yours. I said, yeah. And that's why I want to know, you know, we, I know what we have to deal with. What do you have to deal with? And he said, well, he said, basically, I have two problems. I can get people saved, but I can't get them into church. And I can't get my people to do what they know they should. But let me tell you why that was a revelation, because then I realized that there is a spirit around this world that, that you get people saved, but, but they, as soon as they get saved, it's like a boat anchor, grabs them by the back of the shirt or by the, by the belt and says, don't go to church. No, you don't want to do that. Go be, get busy doing this. Go do that. And so the Bible tells us in the last days, they'll not endure sound doctrine. Guys, if you want to come up with a crazy doctrine, this is the time. And, and you'll get followers. You say, why? Because if you're repelled from good doctrine, where are you going to end up? And it says they'll not endure sound doctrine. So if they're not going to keep sound doctrine, what are they going to get? Now, let me tell you what God does. In his infinite wisdom, there are some idiots, saved idiots. Don't even think that. But anyway, there are some saved idiots. <clears throat> and you know what God does? He, he takes those idiots and he puts them out in the middle of nowhere. And he gives them about a dozen people. And he just lets them there and just, you know, they, they can't hurt themselves. They can only hurt a dozen folks, so it's really no problem. And then along comes the internet. And, and now this doofus who, you know, is lucky to find his feet if he starts at his knees and uses both hands. And he now has a worldwide ministry. And I'm not going to say we're in Phoenix, Arizona or anything like that. And I don't want you to think of anybody in particular. <clears throat> But here's what I say. I say this. You know, I go from church to church. My ministry is called a friend to churches. I want to be a friend to churches. And if these are, in fact, flocks of sheep, right? If I visit numerous flocks and they all tell me the same wolf is attacking my flock, somebody needs to get that wolf. All right? And so without apology, and I don't often say without apology, believe it or not, but without apology... <coughs> Uh, we're, we're going to take care of you. <coughs> and what I'm going to talk to you about tonight uh, is, uh, is this, because this is part of the, 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 uh, the 12-year-old uh, mentality that God is done with Israel. I've said this time and again when I preach. I don't believe that Israel is God's chosen people. I believe they still are God's chosen people. Because I believe they still are God's chosen people. You know, guys, I can find all kinds of verses in this Bible since I got saved that apply to me. They're all, woo, blessings. You ever find a verse in there that's a blessing to you? Yeah, I find all kinds of verses in this Bible that are blessings to me. I don't have to, to, to hip check Israel out of the picture and try to pick their pocket and grab one that God gave them. And so here's all I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to give a little, bit of, uh, a little bit of the history of Israel for about uh, oh, 45 minutes to an hour. And then we'll get into the message. <laughs> Genesis chapter 12. 
Look at Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12, this is where it all starts. God chose a man. Now, uh, you know, I never ask God why he does things. And it's good. I have asked him a few things, and he doesn't tell me anyway, so I, I get the hint. It's not that God doesn't know. He's just not interested in me knowing. And so I don't have to know. Uh, do you ever have anything happen to you and somebody said, I know why God did that to you? And I thought, well, why did he tell you? Were you answering my phone that day? Was this, why, why is he telling? He's telling people you don't even know why he does something in your life. <clears throat> but look what it says here. In verse 1, he says, Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That is the beginning of what we now know as the nation of Israel, all right? Uh, Abraham, God chose him. Why? I don't know. I know he is later called the friend, but we don't find, we don't find him doing anything that, that, that stood out. Uh, the Bible talks about David having been a man after God's own heart before God chose him to be king. So David was doing something. Maybe Abraham was doing something. We're just not aware of it, but something about Abraham. God chose him, and he said, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to make you a blessing. Guys, they're a blessing. They're a blessing. You know, I put out a letter, and, and, um, and, and I get these guys every now and then, they call me. Now, I tell people this, um, especially out here in the West, when, when it's just before church, when about four or five trucks pull in and they're all painted camouflage, and the guys get out and they're all wearing camouflage, this is not going to be a regular Sunday night service. And I have been on the, com uh, the, the compounds, you know. I asked a guy one time, I said, I said, where do you get your mail? He was in a state that starts with an I and ends with a ho. And, um, <laughs> and I said, uh, I said, where do you get, I said, don't they, don't they, I mean, come on, you, you think they don't know where you are? They deliver your mail, don't you? He goes, I get my mail in Texas under another name. <laughs> well, I've been getting mine in Ohio under several names. And so, um, <clears throat> and, and they all like, uh, they, they like conservative things, you know, and they like Bible stuff. But boy, you talk about Israel, and all of a sudden they go off, they sound like they ought to be getting, a, they're, like a, they're doing a, a job interview for CNN. I mean, they hate the Jews. I had a guy call me one time, and he said, I liked your letter, saying, good, good, you know. He said, just one problem, because there's always one problem. And, um, and I said, what is it? He goes, well, you talked about Israel like they're good. I said, well, they're God's chosen people. And he goes, he goes, they run the banks. I said, I know, yeah. I said, uh, that's why God blessed us. Now, if you don't like the Jews run the banks, I'm with you. Let's give those banks to the Muslims. <laughs> Man, if you don't pay on your credit card. <clears throat> oh, you don't like the Muslims. Okay, okay, let's give the banks to the Roman Catholic Church. Somehow, I like the Jews running the banks. Okay, just, you know what God said? Hey, stupid, just let them run the banks and shut up and I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you. Guys, they have blessed us. God has blessed us. And so he gives, this is known as the Abrahamic blessing. Now you want to follow this because there are people that claim to have that blessing. Take a look at Genesis chapter 17. And in Genesis chapter 17, again, you know the story here. Uh, Abraham had a, had, a, had a child named Ishmael. Man, did the whole world is paying for one time a guy listened to his wife. I take that back. Twice. Adam listened to his wife, and that day he's wearing an apron. I mean, somebody should have saw that coming. And so Abraham's a little bit weak in faith here, you know, and he says, oh, it's, oh man, I just wish Ishmael would live before you. Why don't you just make Ishmael your guy? And look what he says. He says in verse 20, uh, Genesis chapter 17, verse 20, and as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him, uh, and, and I will make him fruitful and multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and he will cut heads off the people all around the world. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was updating the text. Forgive me. And it will make him a great nation. Look at this. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac. All right, so here's, that's a key verse. You know why? Because Abraham has had this blessing. God gave Abraham this blessing, correct? You know what you just saw? You just saw God say, you're going to hand that blessing off to your son Isaac. It does not go to Ishmael. It does not go to anybody else. Now Isaac is the one with the blessing, correct? Now can I show you a remarkable thing? Because some of you are just a wee bit crooked. 
Look at chapter 28. But chapter 27, chapter 27 is the famous chapter. We'll, we'll, we'll be there for a second. Chapter 27 is the famous chapter <clears throat> where, where uh, Jacob steals the blessing. And, um, I, you know, I read this. You know what, you know what always kind of makes me like... <clears throat> All right, you remember what his, what his mother said? Go get, a, you know, go get this young ram and lamb. And, and they skinned it and put it on him. I mean... That's yucky. <laughs> Could you imagine watching somebody skin a young lamb and then cutting it to fit so that, because that's what happened, put it on him so he'd think it was Ishmael. I mean, that's kind of like gross. But he, but he goes and gets this blessing, correct? And here's the amazing thing. Can I tell you something? Always follow the rules and always strive lawfully. You say, well, if he had done everything right, God, uh, Ishmael would have given Abrahamic blessing to Esau. No, he wouldn't. No, he wouldn't. You know why? Now, here's what he gets from this. Yes, he gets a blessing. He gets alienated from his brother. He never sees his, his mother alive again. And he has to run for his life that night. But look at chapter 28. And Isaac called Jacob, verse 1, and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, Take thou, uh, thou shalt uh, not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan, Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy, thy mother's brother. And God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. Now hold it. I thought the guy unloaded his blessing bag in the previous chapter. So all the time he thinks he's blessing Ishmael, he's holding something back from Ishmael. Correct? Verse 4. And give thee the blessing of Abraham. He got, if, if he said, I've got to steal this, I've got to lie, I've got to impersonate my brother, because my dad is going to give that blessing to my brother, and I think I ought to get it. If that's why he did all that, he didn't get it by doing that anyway. He was going to get it all along. Guys, don't cheat. Don't cheat. You say, why? Well, you might get something. But you'll never know if God wants you to have it or not. If you just, just strive lawfully, i got to take care of you. So now we've watched this. God gives Abraham the blessing uh, in Genesis chapter 12. It goes from Abraham to Isaac in Genesis chapter 17. In Genesis chapter 28, it goes to Jacob. And Jacob is Israel. That's where it stays, correct? All right, the rest is history. Uh, the rest is history. The rest is all this book and the history of Israel. Is that, is that not true? You don't ever find that blessing being given to any other person in this book. And listen, this is God's divine record. If it had happened, it would have been in here. Nobody else. You don't find God saying to any Jew, you don't find God saying any official representative of Israel, I am taking this blessing and I'm giving it to somebody else. He never does that. You know why? Because he never did it. It's not recorded because it didn't happen. But we know what happened to Israel. Israel got away from their God. Man, they got away from their God. Say, how bad? How's this? Worse than the heathen. Second Chronicles chapter 33. Worse than the heathen. That was the description. My, my. You know, I, I, I preached for Dennis years over there in New Guinea. And um, <clears throat> that is a third world country, okay? And if, if you were to go to New Guinea today, or how's this? Go to uh, Zimbabwe and go to the cold-blooded murderer Robert Mugambi and tell him, in my country, we let men marry men. And you know what that heathen would say? We don't allow that around here. You know what the lost third world countries would say about that? We don't allow that here. You know what this nation is? This nation has become worse than the heathen. And along with that, wandering from God. I, I don't know if I can, we could say wandering. I mean, like they like, put their back on God and, and ran as fast as they could. And you know the judgments that happened, and it was incremental. Uh, I think some things that happened to Israel were not the judgment of God. I call on God's alarm clock. I know, I know you may disagree. I don't think the Twin Towers was God's judgment. I really do not. You say, why? If you look at the Bible in Israel, 
God brought a lot of terrible things into Israel, and what happened? He'd bring it in, and they'd get right. And he'd bring something else, and they'd get right. And then he'd wander, and he'd do it again, and they'd get right. Once God judged them, it was never business as usual again. You think you're going to be sitting here on a Tuesday night after God judges this place? You think you're going to pull into a restaurant and you can't find a table? You know, we have a recession in the judgment of God. <laughs> yes, listen to your college football this year and see how many times you hear a record crowd, parenthesis, during the judgment of God. <laughs> I think the Twin Towers was God trying to wake us up. And he did. Because two things had happened. This nation turned back to God and this nation got more patriotic. Now before you say what you're going to say. As soon as I say that, somebody says, we only lasted about three weeks. That's because if the, if the news media hates anything or any two things, they hate patriotism and they hate God. And they went into their full court press so that within three weeks of the two, Twin Towers, we, the victims, were apologizing to the perpetrators for being racist. Look, you, this is a sidebar, but from now until November 16th, Every single day, the news media is going to have something to show you that you're a racist so they can con you into voting for somebody that doesn't have a brain come November 16. But once God judged Israel, brother, it was not business as usual. It was horror. It was horror on horror. And so Israel was carted off. Israel was conquered. Uh, they had the seven years of captivity. It all culminated in 70 AD with the destruction of the temple. And the nation of Israel was erased from the map of the globe. There was a time if you went, I, I like globes, all right? I've always had a thing. You say, you, got, you collect them? Are you kidding me? I live in a trailer. <laughs> I'm, lucky to collect a, I'm, I, I'm lucky to collect food. <laughs> I tell people, we got a policy. You know, we only got one closet. And my wife, if she gets a new dress, she has to get rid of a dress. And if I get a new suit, she has to get rid of a dress. <laughs> I mean, you got to have some kind of a working situation and... You know how far they've gotten? Take a look at, it, look at Romans chapter 11. And we're going to be going there, so Romans uh, 11 will be there a little bit. But in Romans chapter 11, and verse 28, it says this verse, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. Oh, man, I heard this 12-year-old in Arizona say, see, Israel is the enemy of God. Uh, you really think the guys outside this building love him much more? I mean, you, uh, if you go to Israel and you try to pass gospel tracts, they're not really going to say, we're glad you're here. But ask Brother Sean when he goes on those college campuses and see what they do there. Okay? If you, I won't even tell you what the homosexuals did in England to people who were who, Christians who were protesting. And what I'm telling you guys is, you say, well, see, the Jews are the enemy of the gospel. The whole lost world is the enemy of the gospel. Is that not true? Where do you find a bunch of lost folks saying, man, we need a bunch of gospel preachers? They don't, even the saved folks don't like gospel preachers anymore. So now they are the enemies of Israel. You should have seen this. I'm sure you, you, you've seen this, but take a look at verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. He wants the Jews saved. He always wanted the Jews saved. He always had a burden for the Jews. The Apostle Paul did. <coughs> for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, uh, you're, you're, you're in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22 right here. Uh, by the reconciling of the world, uh, be the reconciling of the world, I'm sorry. Uh, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? He said if, if casting Israel away brought the brought the Gentile word in, world into reconciliation with God, then if God tells the Gentiles, get away from me again, it, then isn't there, can he bring the Jews back? 16, for if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. Now note that word. What's the first word in that verse? You know what you think boasting is? You think boasting is, uh, my house is bigger than yours, my yard is nicer than yours, and my car costs more than yours. No, you know what boasting is? Boasting is, is when a Gentile tries to position themselves above the Jews. 
That's why you remember when we were looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and one of the things of the last days is what? That men should be boasters. It's not talking about men will be beating their chest saying I can do more push-ups than you. It is, it is people trying to push Israel out and position themselves as Israel. Boast not thyself against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Guys, it doesn't take much. You've got the olive tree. It's a wild, or it's a good olive tree. And God took some of the branches out. By the way, he didn't even say he took them all out. Would somebody get that one through? He said, I'm taking some of them out. And they took us, and we are the dogs, and we are the barbarians, and we are the wild olive branch. And he grafted us in. And he said, look, man, I mean, it's olive is olive. It's not, uh, I, I've heard guys can graft like peaches to pear trees and, and apple stuff. And I, man, that's not me. I don't know what, I just go out there and pick it all. But if he can put the wild olive branch, he said, just remember one thing. The root is what's holding you up. And he never got rid of the root. And he not, never got rid of the trunk. And the trunk is still what? Israel. That's why I remember I had a guy in my church, he had a bumper sticker on his truck. My boss is a Jewish carpenter. That's why we want a Jewish book. That's why we want the God of the Jews. We had Gentile gods, did we not? And when we got saved, look, they may have, they may have twisted around trying to present them as the God of the Bible, but we had Gentile, Gentile gods. And we left those behind and we embraced the God of the Jews. We have a Jewish Savior. And we focus around Israel and we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, right? That's not natural for us to do. And if you go over there and talk to them, it's really not natural. We want to do things to them. Look at verse um, 19. Thou wilt say then, the branches are broken off, that I might be grafted in. See, there's the boasting. Well, God, you know, he had the Jews. And then, then I came along. He got rid of the Jews because if he didn't get rid of them, he wouldn't have me. And I say it all the time, guys. There's nothing about you or me that turned his head. Listen, there wasn't anything about you. There isn't anything about me. There isn't anything about every Christian who's ever trusted Christ, both dead and alive right now. If you grouped them all together corporately, there was nothing about all of us, the spiritual value, that would turn God's head enough to say, wow, Jesus, go down and die for them. I need them. Look, when he was praying in the garden, let this cup pass from me. If his father would have said, yes, yeah, son, you know, they're just not worth it. Come on home and just, just let them go to hell. Heaven would still be heaven because he is there. You aren't adding anything to it. I'm not adding anything to it. You understand? God was never wringing his hands. Oh, what do I do if I don't get kip up here? Right? And that's what it is. It's, oh, he got rid of the Jews so he, so he could have us. Right. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, <coughs> the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, uh, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if thou being cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature, and, and this is, is this not contrary to our nature? Am I, am I talking to people here tonight that before you were saved, if somebody would have said some night, you're going to drive miles and miles and miles to sit in a church service on a Tuesday night. If somebody would have told some of you that, we wouldn't want to know what you said in response. Isn't that true? If somebody would have told me that I was going to be in church three times on Sunday, you wouldn't want to know what I told them. Isn't that right? And then, oh, I'm going to be on a Saturday night? Are you kidding? You know what goes on on a Saturday night? You say, what are you saying? I am saying that all of this is contrary to our nature. This is contrary to our nature. They also, uh, I'm sorry, verse 24, if they, if, uh, for if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, or grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall they... Uh, shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be, be wise in your own conceits, that blindness, what's the next two words? In part. That's all. You say, what kind of blindness? I'll show you. That blindness in part has happened to Israel, 
until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. You know what God is doing? God is dealing with the Gentiles. He is dealing with the Gentile nations. Uh, he has shifted his whole plan. You know, one of the things that I always uh, talk about, uh, Matthew chapter 16, where, uh, verse 18, where he says, uh, Thou art Peter, upon this rock I'll build my church, and, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. <clears throat> and I always say that in that verse, God got a new car. Or I should say he got a new vehicle. You say, why? Because prior to that, whenever God wanted something done, he went to the Jews. Guys, the Jews sent out missionaries. Matthew chapter 23, verse 15, he said, you guys can pass sea and land to get one proselyte. He said, did you ever get him? Read Acts 2. We hear in the language that we were born, it said they were Jews and what? What was the Ethiopian eunuch? He was, I'll tell you what he was. He was the result of Jewish missions. And when God wanted something done, and when he wanted somebody to write something, <clears throat> he went to the Jews, and then they rejected him. And so he needed a new vehicle to take his message. It's called the church. And here we are. But it's only until he's done with us. And the time of the Gentiles is nearing. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at verse 12. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. I like that. We use great plainness of speech. Right. Guys, this uh, sidebar, uh, I have some stuff on the internet. And my nemesis, on the, or I'm his nemesis, uh, James White, <clears throat> uh, alias Snow. Um, you know, I don't, I don't ever, I, listen, I don't listen to my critics. I don't listen to their stuff. I mean, they, somebody sends me a 38-minute video. You think I'm going to sit in front of a video and watch 38 minutes? You're out of your mind? That is 38 minutes that I could actually be doing something? I, I'm not going to do that. But here's what everybody tells me. They said, well, Gip is too simplistic. I'd take that. I think they think that is an insult. Have you ever talked to anybody when they were done talking? You didn't know what they said. Yeah, well, shortly, shortly thereafter, you came up short of some change. Right? He said, I, we use great plainness of speech. That's the problem with the Apostle Paul. It's just too simplistic. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. He went up there and spent 40, 40 days in the presence of God, and he didn't realize that his face is literally glowing. And when he came down here, the Jews couldn't look on him, and so they put the veil. You know when the veil was there? You couldn't tell if his face was glowing or not. You're blind. Blindness in part. That veil is still there. But their minds were blinded, for until, the day, uh, for until this day remaineth the same veil taken, uh, untaken away uh, in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. So today, Israel is the enemy of the gospel. But so is every other lost person on the planet. I mean, yeah, you might find some good, godly, old, lost Methodist lady who thinks preaching is great. But the fact is that most of the lost world are the enemies of the gospel. Is that not true? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32 Give none offense neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. I know this sounds crazy, but I am a, I am a Baptist. I'm in a Baptist church, and I'm talking to the church of God. There are three people. You know, I, I refer to myself as a Gentile. But the fact is that when I got saved, I was no longer a Gentile. I am now part of the church of God. When a person is a Jew. Now, Paul calls it. He, he refers back to his lineage. He said, I was a Jew. In my flesh, I was a Jew. But he is part of the church of God. So, so you don't want to go back in. You know, I see a lot of these people that get into, the, they, they try to push the saved Jews to go back to the old Jewish worship. Why would you do that? Why, would you let, why don't you go back on Saturday night and get drunk? I mean, why would you go back? And so there are Jews out there and they're lost. There are Gentiles out there and they're lost. If they're, Jews, if they're not Jews and they're Gentiles, then there's us. And that's the three groups that God recognizes. Look at... Um, now, now, this is going to be, go back to uh, chapter 10, Romans chapter 10. This will be about the restoration of Israel because the teaching is that God is not going to restore Israel. And I want you to know that that is a very easy doctrine to believe. 
if you never read your Bible. Because I got news for you guys. That is one of the most repeated messages of the Bible. I mean, I'll, I'll explain in a little while how, how much that message is, is uh, repeated. But look what it says in Romans chapter 10. And it says this in verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and, uh, and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. If you want to know what's wrong with Israel today, they simply haven't bowed the knee to Jesus Christ. But is that not what's wrong in our country? Is that not the problem in every nation? You've got flags all over here. I love to come in this church and go up and down that hall and look at those missionaries uh, and the letters. I'm always praying over missionaries when I go. I, I go to the prayer letters and try to pray for all the missionaries. And, and I, you know, we're, try, we're trying to get everybody. Is this not really what we're trying to do? We're just trying to get them to bow their knee to Jesus Christ. And look what it did for you. And look what it did for me. If, if all we got out of that was saved, that's pretty good. And I don't believe there's one person here that all you got was saved. You got a whole lot more than just saved. Isn't that right? Look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Oh, wait, 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 11. I'm sorry, we're, here, we're here, here at Romans. Let's do 11, chapter 1. I say then, hath God, here it is, cast away his people. Note this. That's called his people. Note that, that occurrence in that verse, because I had somebody write me and they said, um, God's people are the people that trust him as their personal savior. The apostle Paul, the greatest Christian ever lived, just called a bunch of lost Jews his people. Didn't he do it? You, you need to mark that down because somebody is going to lay that on you someday that only saved people are his people. And you're going to go, oh, well. I'll go. And if you're so dumb that all you do is when somebody says that, you go, you don't even check it out. Because you have to, you know, you have to get home and watch Storage Wars, the important things of life. <laughs> I say again, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also an Israelite. You know what he's saying? Man, I'm glad I didn't cast them away because I'm one. He said, if he got rid of all the Jews, how would I get saved? So he said, I'm, I'm, I'm an Israelite of the, tri of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. So, so God has not cast away his people. Now go to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. That's right after Deuteronomy chapter 29. In case you're having trouble finding it. Look at verse 1. And it came to pass, when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse that I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee. You know what's amazing about this? Are they even in the land yet? They're not even in the land. You know what he's telling them? I just want to let you guys know, I got this land flowing with milk and honey. Let me tell you all the good things are going to happen. And by the way, then you're going to be bad. I'm going to crush you and I'm going to, I'm going to scatter you all over the earth. I mean, he's already in the last chapter of the book to them. But it ain't the last chapter of the book, is it? He said, I am gonna, I'm going to put you in this land, then I'm going to drive you out of it. That's what he said. The nations that have driven thee. Uh, blessing, 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 let's see. Oh, among all the nations where the Lord thy God uh, have, hath driven thee, verse 2. And, to return, and look, and shall return unto the Lord thy God, and shall obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, and all thine heart, and, and with all thy soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. If any of thee of thine be driven out unto the uttermost parts of heaven. That sounds like a long way off. From thence will the Lord thy God gather thee and from thence will he fetch thee and the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. He is telling the Jews that. If you say, well, I got saved, that makes me a Jew, so it's mine. You can't put yourself in that. Now, there's no honest way you can do that. He is saying this to the Jews. 
take a look at um, 2 Chronicles chapter 9. 2 Chronicles chapter 9. Look at verse 8. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighted in thee to set thee on his throne, uh, to, be king of the, uh, uh, to be king for the Lord thy God, because thy God loved Israel to establish them. What's the next two words? Forever. He said what? Who is he going to establish forever? Israel. He didn't say the Jews. He said Israel. Well, that forever. You better not mess with forever, because I think you've got a promise like that. If we're going to start arguing that forever doesn't mean forever, somebody might look at some of our forevers. I mean, I got some forevers that I'm hanging on to, okay? And so I, I'm pretty sure forever kind of like is forever. To be, the king, uh, uh, to be king for the Lord thy God, because thy God loved Israel to establish them forever. Therefore he made he, made he uh, the king over them to do judgment and justice. He said Israel would be established forever. If that forever is not forever, there are no forevers. That's like italics. You know, people say, well, the italics, you know, those were added. They don't belong. Okay, take them out. Take them out. You know something? If you told them to take them out, they'd find a place and go, we can't take this one out. Whoa, 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 whoa. They don't belong in there. Take them all out. Oh, well, no, these belong here. Whoa, who are you? Who are you? You know which ones belong and you would know which. I have met God. Check their hands for nail holes. Because if you don't have nail holes in your hands, you can't tell me which italicized word stays or goes. We either get rid of all of them or we keep them all. If you don't mind, we'll just keep them all. And if you're going to tell me which forever really means forever and which forever doesn't mean forever, if you don't have, I'm going to check your hands. And if you don't have the holes, I'm going to just take forever as meaning forever. Unless it's a guarantee by the government. Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah is an amazing book because Jeremiah is the, um, he's the guy that said, man, you guys are going to get your heads knocked off. <coughs> it is the book of Jeremiah. <clears throat> Jeremiah brings Israel so much bad news. Does he not? It is the book of Jeremiah that they're overrun, they're overrun, and they're conquered. I mean, you say, well, Jeremiah's got so much bad stuff, then it's no, then it's no coincidence that Jeremiah has so much stuff about the restoration. Right. Come on, you spanked your kid. And then you, then you reestablish the relationship, correct? correct? When you spank him, and then you get done, you let him know why you did it, you let him know you still love him, you don't want him to think that because you spanked him that you hate him. Hmm. Anyway. <laughs> well, you know what God's going to do? Uh, guys, we have never had a spanking like what God did to Israel. You say, how bad? How about taking little Jewish babies by the ankles and splattering their brains out on stone walls? I don't even like to read what he did to women that were respecting children. When that's happening, you know what Israel is going to say? He hates us. He has written us off. So in the very book that he said, you're going to be judged, he let them know they're going to be restored. It was necessary that he did it in the same book so he knew, yes, I'm going to spank you, but you'll still be mine. Amen. Chapter 23, look at verse 3. And here's the amazing thing here in this, in this book. You will find some of this prophecy fulfilled in, in 1948 when Israel came back into the land. And then kind of like a, a, a uh, 2,000 year hiatus between that and the rest of the verse. Chapter 23, look at verse 3. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries, whither I have driven them, all right, and will bring them uh, again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. Does that not describe Israel today? Now, he hasn't brought them all out of every country. So if you want to make that future, that's fine. But guys, he brought the Jews out of all the countries that he, they were in, uh, out of all kinds of countries, and he reestablished them. And on May 14th, 1948, every map in the world changed. If the map was printed on April 13th, or on May 13th, 1948, there was no nation of Israel. And on the 14th, there was a nation of Israel. But the ink wasn't even dry before 14 nations waged war on Israel to drive them into the sea. And when that war was over, Israel had more land than was given to him by the, by the uh, United Nations mandate. And so he said... All right, so I'm just going to count this. Okay, that's 1948. He gave it back. But look at verse 6. 
In his days, Judah shall be saved in Israel. See this? Now look, you can't say you're talking about saved people being called Jews. He's talking about Judah. He's talking about Israel. In his days, shall be, uh, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. <clears throat> uh, and this is his name, uh, whereby he, he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they, they shall no more. Now watch this. They shall no more say, the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Guys, of all the things that have happened in the history of Israel, that, has, that is like the number one thing. Right. right? That is what got it. The whole thing started. They talk about the God that brought Israel out of Egypt. That was the biggest thing that happened in all of their history. That is, that's a history of miracles from God. But the biggest one is that he brought them out of Egypt, correct? And so he is known to them as the God. You say, oh, I don't know if God will help us. Hey, this is the God that got us out of Egypt. Well, you know, I mean, they're surrounding us. They're going to, yeah, yeah, but hey, God got us out of Egypt. If he can get us out of Egypt, he can do this. He said, you won't even know me. You won't even refer to me as the God that brought you out of Egypt. You say, why? Because I'll do something even greater. What? Verse 8. Said the Lord, uh, look at verse 7 again. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, the Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt. But the Lord liveth, with, which brought up, uh, and which led the seed of the house of Israel. Hold it. You want to try to say that's people, that's Gentiles that got saved. You have to, listen, you are so crooked, when you die, they'll just screw you into the ground. He said the seed of Israel. I'll bet if some one of these guys finds a curse on the seed of Israel, I'll bet they'll, they'll say that one's Israel. The Lord liveth which brought up and which led the seed of Israel, uh, seed of the house of Israel, out of the north country and from all countries whither I have driven them and they shall dwell in their own land. You say, what is that? That is a promise of restoration that is future. Take a look at chapter 30. Chapter 30, Jeremiah. I will not read all this. I've got a long uh, passage here, 11 verses. I'm only going to read 10 of them. Well, look what he says, verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. And lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people, Israel and Judah, saith the Lord. Guys, he is talking to Jews. Can you imagine him saying this to Jews? He's saying, now look, I am going to bring Israel and Judah out of captivity, but I just let you know that that's really not you guys. That's really, some, that's really a bunch of Gentiles that are going to, uh, they've got a whole different thing going. You know what's funny about this? Don't we say about dispensations that basically a dis the, the description of a dispensation is God's different way of dealing with people at a given time? And, and I, I know of a clown who, who pastors what he calls a church in Arizona. I won't say where it is in Phoenix. And he doesn't believe in dispensations. But he believes that he's a Jew. And that all the promises to Israel are his. It almost sounds like God's dealing in a different way with people now. Oh, so he doesn't believe in dispensations. He only believes the ones that he declares. Yeah, get an ice cream cone from him. It's about the only thing you're going to get. Look at verse 11. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of, oh my, look at that. The whole thing got reversed. We get told that God has made a full end of Israel and he's going to bless us. And he said, no, no. He said, you guys are okay. It's all the other nations I'm going to get rid of. Right. Though I make a full end of all nations, whither I've scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee, but I will, cor I will correct thee in measure and will not leave thee, uh, leave thee un uh, altogether unpunished. He said, I will punish you. But he said, it's the other nations I'm going to wipe off the, the planet, not you guys. And it's just the opposite of what is what these guys teach. Chapter 31, verse 35. Thus saith the Lord, which gave the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances, the moon and the stars, 
If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. He said, if the moon and the stars disappear, then there'll be no more Israel. Guys, and that you can't, no, please, please. I mean, if you're gonna, if you're gonna try to tell me that's a bunch of Gentiles 2,000 years later to trust Christ, take drugs because you need an excuse to say such stupid things. Chapter 33. Chapter 33. Verse 7. And I will cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel to return, and I will build them as at the first. You cannot pretend he's talking to anybody else. Look at verse 14. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, <coughs> that I will perform that good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. Anybody tries? You, you guys, you cannot pretend that he's not talking to the Jews. I'm talking about the Israelites. I'm talking about the Israelis. I don't know what you want to call them. The children of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I'm talking about the physical seed of Abraham. He's, that's who he's talking to. He's talking about physical Jews. And he's going to restore them. Look at Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out, of the, out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of a valley that was full of bones. Now, you know the story. This is where that stone comes from. That way, the head, bo foot, bone, connect to the leg, bone, leg, bone, connect to the knee. That's where this come from. They started singing about it. Why did I tell you to come? Oh, Ezekiel. Yeah, Ezekiel 37, yes. I, knew it. I, I, I have to read all this. I'm not going to read all this. Let's just pick it up about verse. Oh, let's pick it up at verse uh, 21. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. How many times, just, just so far in this message, how many times you heard, you're going you're to be driven out there, then I'm going to bring you back here to your land and you're going to be okay. I mean, it's the same thing, the same thing. And, if, and don't we say this, if God says something twice, it's established. You say, well, why is he being so redundant? Maybe because he knows there's going to be a day when there's going to be a spirit where you're going to see it. You're going to, it's going to be right there in your King James Bible and you're still going to be watching the internet and because some guy's got a real pretty video, you're going to be convinced that God's done with Israel. Because we now relate good video work to truth. And the value of the message is, is deemed by the, by the value of the video, the quality of the video. Whether they, they be gone and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land, and I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them, uh, to them all, uh, and they shall be no more two nations. Guys, this is talking about Judah. This is talking about Israel. You have got, listen, if you, if you are going to lie and try to say that that is saved Gentiles, all I can tell you is you have a chance to run for president with the Democratic Party for, for 2016. They need somebody with your ability to lie. Look at uh, that's 28, verse 28. And the heathen shall know that I, am the, that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them for... There's that thing again. Chapter 38, verse 8. After many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years, latter years thou shalt come, uh, thou shalt come into the land that, uh, that is uh, brought back from the, from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, uh, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of, out of the nations and they shall dwell, all, uh, they shall dwell safely, all of them. The promise is always the same. I'm going to gather all the Jews together. I'm going to put them in Israel. I'm going to destroy their enemies. They're going to live here forever, and I'm going to bless them. They're going to live in their own land. He said it over and over and over and over. You know what I tell people? I cannot take a hint. I really can't. I can't take a hint. Did you ever do that? I mean, somebody, you know, well, it's, uh, wow, look, our clock on the wall. There it is. It's midnight. But that's okay. You can stay here. But when you leave, we're going to bed. Just, you know, when you leave, just turn out the lights. I mean, I, do you ever have somebody trying to tell you something and you don't get it? 
And then later you go, oh, that's what they were trying to say. <laughs> you do that? You know, what, you know what you do when somebody can't take a hint? You say it over and over and over and over and over. That's why back in Genesis 12, he said, I'll bless you, and you'll be a blessing, and I'll bless them to bless you and curse them to curse you, and in these shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. He said, in case you idiots can't figure out what I'm going to do to Israel, they're going to be blessed, 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 blessed. And in Ruth chapter 4, he said, uh, you can redeem. If you're going to redeem it, you redeem it. If you don't redeem it, then I'll redeem it. We'll all redeem it, and we'll redeem how I love to proclaim it. And so God says it over and over and over. So in Jude, he says, ungodly people, they're ungodly deeds, and they're ungodly, ungodly, ungodly. Look how many times he has said, you're going to be in all the nations. I'm going to bring you out. I'm going to put you back in the land. I'm going to destroy the other nations. I'm going to establish you forever in your land. You say, yeah, preacher. Why well, he keeps showing us? God must have known that you are so dense. If not wicked, then dense. And he's got to say it over and over because apparently there are some people today that cannot take a hint. Maybe I'll give you a break. It's that spirit. It's that spirit that is permeating our world that will just make us all naturally reject sound doctrine. So you get the bad doctrine that God has done with Israel. Look at the book of Micah. Just 45 more of these and I'll be done. I, I really am trying to hurry, I want to, but I, I want you to see these. Micah chapter 5, verse 7. Oh, look at this. He has a name for them. They're called the remnant of Jacob. You guys, we get called a lot in the New Testament. I don't ever find us ever being called the remnant of Jacob. And the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as a, as a dew from the Lord. As the showers upon the grass that tarrieth not for man, nor waiteth for the sons of men. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles, in the midst of many people, as a lion among the beasts of the forest, as a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who, if he go through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. Thine hand shall be lifted up upon thine adversaries, and all thine enemies shall be cut off. The exact opposite is true. Israel's not being thrown out and we are being established on top of them. He said, Israel will be destroying the Gentile nations. And is that not what we read in the book of Revelation? Zechariah, I love this. This is, this is the coolest thing. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord of hosts came to me saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy and I was jealous for her with great fury. Thus saith the Lord, uh, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of, the, of hosts, the holy mountain. He loves that place. He loves that place. I have no idea why. No, I, don't, I mean, look, if you want to pick Israel, I, it's okay. You ever been to Israel? You ever been to, to Jerusalem? I mean, we were, over there, we were over there last November, and it is hot, it's rocks, and it's dirt, and it's dry. And I'm, I'm walking around Jerusalem, and I, I told Kathy, I said, babe, I said, doesn't God know everything? Well, he does, doesn't he? I said, does he not know about Hawaii? <laughs> I mean, really? I mean, how could you create Hawaii and say, now Jerusalem, oh, that does something for me. <laughs> but then he picked a dirt ball and made him a son of God, so I don't know, it doesn't, never, does, never does figure. Verse 4, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the, there shall yet be old, now let's skip, I mean, we're going to skip this, just talking about Israel. Look at verse 8. And I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. Now, here's what I like. This is, this is prophetic, absolutely prophetic. This has never taken place in your lifetime or mine. This has not taken place since the Lord Jesus Christ was on this earth. This has never happened yet. This is a prophecy of what's going to happen when Israel is back in their land, and they are the number one world power next to nobody. It says this in verse 22. I look forward to this. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men. Ten? Ten? Whose number is that? 
You think it's a coincidence God threw 10 in there? Right. 10 men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, we will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. There's a day coming when 10 men out of 10 different nations are going to grab a hold of the skirt of a Jew and said, we heard you're going up Jerusalem. You going up Jerusalem? Yeah, can we go with you? We've heard God is with you. Man, I look forward to that. And think about it. There's something. Let me just show you a little sidebar. This, it says God is with you, right? What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. You know, one of the funniest things happens, if it can be funny, in Matthew chapter 1, Joseph is, he, you know, he finds out that Mary's expecting. He's going to put her off quietly because he doesn't want her killed. And, and Gabriel shows up and says, hey, hey, yeah, let her alone. You see, you know who she's carrying? Emmanuel. Really? Yeah. And, and so when the child's born, they walk up to Joseph and say, so what are you going to call him? Jesus. Did he, I, come on, I was there when Gabriel said Emmanuel. Right? I'm reading there. Gabriel said, he shall be Emmanuel. And when Joseph gets to give him a name, he calls him Jesus. Did he not read two verses ahead? You say, why didn't he call him Emmanuel? Because he was never with him. It says in John, he came unto his own, and his own, that's right. But, but do you understand when it says that God is with you, that you just read Emmanuel? But hang on. I See, I don't think this will ever happen. I don't think in eternity anybody's going to say, let's go to Jerusalem and see Jesus. See, he's never been officially called who? Emmanuel. I think they'll say, let's go to Jerusalem and see God is with us. Emmanuel. Take a look at this. Uh, look at, wait a second. Take a look at uh, Revelation chapter 21. Remember I told you God says, he, he repeats it and says it and says it and says it because if you're thick, you might finally get it. You know what I'm going to tell you? I told you that I can't take a hint. Okay, I'm thick-headed and I got it. How stupid do you have to be to not get it? You have to be like 12 years old, probably hitting the head too many times, or not enough. Revelation chapter 21, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth were pass, passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now watch, watch what occur, uh, how many times this occurs. And heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. That's Emmanuel. And he, and he will dwell with them. That's Emmanuel. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. He said, God is with them, God is with them, God is with them three times in that verse. That's who's going to be sitting on the throne. And man, Zechariah chapter 8, they're going to say, Can we go with you? Can we get in? We, we, I, I've heard God's with you. Yeah, you can come for a small price. <clears throat> Look at Joel. Look at Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3. Look at verse 20. But Judah shall dwell. What's that, what's that say? Forever. And Jerusalem from generation to generation, for I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. He says, I'm going to give them all a pass. I'm going to give them all a break. Malachi chapter 3. And I'll show you what's going to happen. Malachi chapter 3. We're just about done. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. We are, according to, to Romans chapter 4, we are called sons of Abraham spiritually. You know why? Because God said something to Abraham, and he just believed it by faith. Now, God didn't say, get down on your knees, trust Jesus Christ, your personal Savior to Abraham. Some people think that's what he said in Genesis 15. But he just said something, and Abe says, good enough for me. And when you got saved, you know what? He said something kind of crazy, didn't he? Somebody died 2,000 years ago, somehow paid for all the sins you're ever going to do, and if you'll take that, you can be saved and you can go to heaven. Guys, that's crazy. You said, what'd you say? Good enough for me. 
Men is good enough for me. Amen. All right? So, so we, see what I'm saying is that our act of faith trusting Christ was similar to the same act of faith of Abraham. We both, God said something crazy and both of us believed it. But we are never called sons of Jacob. We are not the sons of Jacob. Say, who are? Those folks roaming around the streets of Jerusalem tonight. Those are the sons of Jacob. And look what he's going to do. Go to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Look at verse 8. Well, look at verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place <clears throat> have been found with the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Guys, that's not talking about us. He's talking about a new covenant. He's talking about a future covenant with Israel. Wait till you see one of the stipulations of this. Very nice. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them uh, by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, <clears throat> because they continued not in my covenant, I regarded them not, saith the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law into their mind laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people you know we you know the, that line from the song prone to wander Lord I feel it prone to leave the God I love and it that that just breaks my heart because it describes me and it describes you does it not but it describes those Jews you know what he said he said, I am going to, he said, I am going to laser my laws in their brain and I'm going to write them in their hearts. And they'll always keep them. You know why? Because they'll always be in their brain and in their heart. And he said, and I will be their God and they will be my people. But it even gets better. Verse 11. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Man, I love to claim that verse. That's not for us. Oh, do I, wait, wait, wait. You say, oh, I want it. Don't you have one? Don't you have one where your sins are gone? Don't you have one where he forgot them? And, and all things become new and old things are passed away. I don't have to try to push. I love that verse. I would love to claim that. But it's them and it's future. That is, that is Israel of the future. That's, you know what that is? That, you might, you might make a cross reference. That is the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 30 verse 6. And I'll just show you one last thing in Ezekiel chapter 48. And I'll show you one of the most useless things God ever did. Do you have, uh, <coughs> in, the, <coughs> in the back of your Bible, you got some maps, and you look at Israel. Did you ever look at, you don't have to do it now, but you ever look at Israel, and you see, you know, Dan is here, and Dan is here, and, and, and Judah is here, and, and Naphtali is here, and, right? And Levi is just <laughs> everywhere. But, but you've seen that map, right? You know what he's going to do? He's going to redraw the map of Israel. And you know how he's going to do it? It's going to be like superimposing a ladder. Think of a ladder with just straight up and down and straight horizontal and superimposing that over Israel. That's exactly what the future boundaries of Israel are going to be. Look what it says. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 48. And he says this. Look at verse 2. Well, let me see. Let's, let's start. Let's just read the first, first verse. Now these <clears throat> are the names of the tribes from the north end to the coast of the way of, he of Hethlin, as one goeth to Hamath, Hezer Enen, the, bar the, the border of Damascus, northward, to the coast of Hamath. For these are his sides, east and west, a portion for Dan. It's east and west. And the border for Dan, from the east side unto the west side, a portion for Asher. And by the border of Asher, from the east side, even unto the west side, a portion for Naphtali. And by the border of Naphtali, from the east side, under the west side, a portion for, for Manasseh. You know what he's saying? He's saying, it's going to be like this. This is, all right, Dan's part is going to be here. And then Asher's will be here. It's going to be, literally, it's going to be 
Just like this. Like Venetian blinds. For a nation that he's thrown away and he's never going to use again. Right? I mean, why did he ever inspire that? Why did he ever say, you're going to have future, these are the future boundaries in the land of Israel when he knew he was never going to do it? Because he's going to do it. How do you know? It said it over and over and over. I'm done. I just want to point something out. Do you believe in Calvary? Do you believe in Calvary? You know why, don't you? Because of one verse. Luke chapter 23, verse 33, it is the single only reference to the word Calvary in Scripture. And look how many times you sing about it. One verse, that is all you've got. And you will fight over that name, won't you? Do you believe in the ascension? Do you believe Jesus Christ went to heaven uh, physically? You know that's only found three places in the Bible. That is found in, in, in Mark 16, verse 19, unless you have one of those Bibles they took the last eight verses out. Luke chapter 20, verse 4, verse 51, and Acts chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. That is the only three places. You believe in the ascension for only three places in Scripture. Guys, I have shown you more volume of Scripture for the restoration of Israel than you have for a, for a doctrine, for a fundamental. You would, listen, would you let anybody try to say Jesus Christ never went physically to heaven? You would never allow that, would you? And you've got far less Scripture than what you have on the restoration of Israel. I told you I wasn't, there was no conviction in this, and there isn't, because I don't think you've done anything wrong, because I, I don't know, I hope nobody is into this, but here, I said there would be a warning, and here's the warning. In the last days, there's going to be a spirit, and it's going to cause men to not endure sound doctrine. Guys, just because you're in a King James Bible even church, and you got your Bible all fixed up, and you got it all square, and you got wide margins and interleaves and, and uh, all that stuff, that spirit, look, if there was smoke in this room, the people that, if there were lost people in here, they'd choke on it, and so would the saved folks. And there's a spirit in this earth right now that is going to have a natural tendency for all of us to turn away from good doctrine. That's only one of them. But that's, that's, that's being taken. So guys, what I'm telling you, here, here's what I say. If, I, I don't say that, we, you know, I don't want to jump, down, jump up and down and say we're so right, we're so right. But you know, this is probably just not a good time to change doctrine. Because all of the candidates are suspect. Because it is in us to turn our back on the doctrine of this book. Don't do that. That's the warning. Don't do that. Not just Israel, but there will be other things. Don't, listen, endure sound doctrine. Salvation, eternal security. Uh, you endure sound doctrine because there's a spirit here now. I don't mean here, but in the whole world. Well, it's not exempt from here. And so therefore, beware of that spirit. And when you start going, you know, I'm not sure the pastor's so right about what he's been teaching. I, and look, nobody can teach the Bible without a flaw. I, I'm going to say this to guys, but I'll just tell you guys this. When I was in Bible college, here's the, here's the conclusion I came to from my first year. If, if this guy can teach me the Bible without making a mistake, he's God. If he can teach me the Bible, if anybody can teach the Bible without one error, they are God, right? And I know they're not God. And then my humanity took over. You know what I thought? Well, then I'll find out where they're teaching me wrong, and I'll correct it, then I'll be God. Guys, we can't be right. You cannot be 100% right. And don't go saying, well, then I need to find out where I'm wrong. Why? You want to be God? But I'm telling you now, there's a spirit that is going to make you want to not listen to that sound doctrine any longer. And it's going to hit us because it's in this world. And that is just one of them. So that's, that's, that's about Israel being restored. But the greater danger is that that spirit is still here. That's, that spirit is in, and that is a latter days thing. I think it's going to be here until the trumpet sounds. Be suspect of you. Be suspicious of you.